we are, of course, as a university, not only into reflection but also assessment. So uh, I think that's an important thing. And importantly, how do we act to do better? And I'm sure that the questions that you have for Diane will tease out a few more of those questions. So, may I open the floor to questions, please? Thank you so much. Uh, John Bird, my name is. Um, many women over the age of 40 withdraw from professional life uh, for the purpose of bringing up children and so on. How do they remain eligible for the leadership roles that you're, or oh, have you got any suggestions as to how to remain eligible for, uh, for the leadership roles you're, uh, you're espousing? Thank you for that question. Um, a lot of leaders, male leaders, ask me about this opt-out issue. Now they see women on what looks like a fast track and then all of a sudden they appear to opt out. I think it's a very complicated equation that's at work here, but at the core of it I'm an economist and so I'm going to tell you what the economist would say. We all make value proposition decisions. We look at the costs and we look at the benefits. Um, and if you're a woman who wants to have children and have a, a full life in that way as well, you're going to recognise how difficult it is to be able to leave your career, come back to your career. The new buzzword for that is the on and off ramp. Um, and so I think women are not really opting out, but they're deciding that I'm going to have to work a bit harder to be acknowledged. I'll probably get less money and my career will be seen as very interrupted. I won't be as eligible for promotion. So they do that sort of mental sum in their head and go, just not really worth the effort. So how do you fix that? I think the way you fix it is you start very early. You build the career map early and you determine where you think the on and off ramps are going to be. And we need to take a leaf out of the book of the male champions of change. David Thody at Telstra in particular, he has set a challenge to his entire organisation, which is don't tell me why a role can't be flexible. All roles are flexible. And then we'll do the if not, why not. And of course there may be one or two roles within the specific context that can't be flexible. So if you've got an environment where all roles are flexible, the world changes. When I was at McKinsey, we had flexible roles. There were more men who took up the flexible roles than there were women. So it benefits everybody. Fantastic question, thank you. But we've got to get that women are opting out because language out and fix the system. It's not women lacking ambition, they lack workplaces that let them achieve the ambition and I know you know that. Other questions? Oh, yes, please, and then to the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for your talk. I. Um just wanted to ask you a bit about your work with Transfield Services, given you've only just taken up the helm there. Um, some would say you've taken on quite a challenge. Um, the, the company um, has been in the media not for necessarily good reasons. Um, so they seem to have been in a precarious financial situation and now they've, um, which may be less of concern with the $1.2 billion contract now that you've just gotten it from the federal government. But uh, are you concerned, I'm interested to know about um, taking up that position, what your vision is, um, and with your particular leadership style, how, how are you intending to turn that around? And are you concerned about um, possibly being a scapegoat for the government in regards to the offshore detention centres and the running of those? Thank you very much. You've just encapsulated pretty much what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> I had... Um, a lovely interaction a couple of weeks ago with an individual shareholder of Transfield who's been a shareholder for a long time and a gentleman who worked in Allard Fields, so he understands what the company does. And he came in and he said to me, do you know how much you've bitten off? He said, why is it when there's always something tough that needs to be done, they turn around and give it to one of the women on the board? <laughs> and he gave me this list of, you know, like three or four, five women, and I thought, good heavens. But the thing is, I joined that board, uh, you know, almost four years ago, and I went in with my eyes open that it was an industry that was going through a lot of change, um, and that's one of the things that really engages and excites me. 
Um, my mum role modelled for me that if something's not quite right, you just get on with it. You know, and so she has, for her entire life, filled gaps where they've been. And I saw a bit of a gap at Transfield and I felt that I had the, the skills to be able to contribute there. Um, so I think, you know, you have to be very clear um, when you take a new role like that where your, your vision is taking you. And I think what Transfield needs to do is go back to its roots of operational excellence and it needs to become an employer that is a stable employer that people will choose to work for. One of the interesting things about Transfield, we employ 23,000 people, but on any day around the world, there will probably be 45,000 people doing work for Transfield clients. Half our workforce are subcontractors. And I'm not sure that's the right answer because I think people want to engage with their employer um, and have a permanent job. We saw it at West Farmers with Coles, um, where most of the workforce was part-time casuals. And now, most of the workforce are permanent. They work on rosters, of course, because you know how long our supermarkets need to be open for. But I think there's something about that compact between the staff member and the company that needs to be changed. So that's a really important part of my vision for Transfield. Um, no one's ever going to make me a scapegoat for anything. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, the situation um, with the transferees on both Nauru and Manus is very, very difficult. Um, the government policy, it's a decision of two democratically elected governments, so I'm never going to question that. But I think my company has a huge responsibility to step up and make sure that the services that we provide are done in absolutely the best possible way. Um, we've actually been on our roof for 12 months and in that time we haven't had one complaint or one issue with a Transfield employee. If we can mirror that on Manus, I know things are going to be better there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question up the back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my name's Sharon Grosser. Um, I'm a small business owner and um, therefore issues around employment and um, you know, gender uh, of concern to me, um, particularly as I'm in a, a fairly male dominated industry. Um, I'm also a teacher and so I've got a, a strong interest in educating and educating boys in this idea of the changing nature of society because I agree that, you know, change has to come from, you know, men as well as women. How do you see us really educating boys around the changing nature of our society in terms of going into the workforce and, you know, working flexibly perhaps um, and, you know, the saying of nobody ever asks a man how he's going to juggle his career and his kids. Thank you, Sharon. That's a, a really interesting topic. I think a lot of young women think, well, you know, what's all the fuss about? Um, things are changing. You know, these were problems that our parents had. It's problems of a past generation. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time with, you know, young university students and so many other people in this room do, and the rubber hits the road, you know, when you get to the employment point and find that still there is a disparity between the starting um, salary for a, a male graduate versus a female graduate. And I think that's a bit of a shock to the system. Um, I'm not sure whether education is the right answer. I think in so many ways, it's um, all around, when I look around me, what do I see? Um, and that's the norms that I live with. So when you go into a large organisation and you look up to the top and there are only men there, then women get some of this opt-out issue. Well, I'm never going to get there anyway, so I might as well when I decide to have children leave anyhow. Um, so I think the real solution is creating that different looking environment, creating the role models at the top. And at the end of the day, you can make quite a lot of changes around education, training around unconscious bias, fix your recruitment processes, you know, training, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't get people flowing through that pipeline to create the organisation that looks like you want, 
then I think you have to have a quota. So at the end of the day, I think what is really going to change things is when quotas occur, the face of organisations change, people see women in leadership roles and the world doesn't fall over. You know, the sky hasn't fallen in in Norway yet um, since they quoted to have 40% uh, female representation on boards. And I think that's what will change the young men because they'll look around and they'll see and it'll just be this is the way we, we work and this is the environment we're in. Unfortunately, that's going to take a long time, so we need to you know, find some interventions that shorten that up. Thank you. You knew I had to get to quotas, didn't you? Everyone was <laughs> waiting to see what I thought about them. Thanks, Michelle. I would really like to see some future moves by government particularly in the areas of daycare centres. Uh, for any woman who works, their career is often uh, held behind by just the fact that try and get daycare after six o'clock in the evening, try and get it on the weekends, all these type of things where you need to travel, you need to work out of hours, all those issues are not available to easily to women and it often falls upon family members to fill that um, breach if they can. Uh, so that's an area that I'd really like to see government improve on. Um, more flexibility around in the, surrounding the daycare issues. I'd also like to see daycare extended in a format that would encourage teenagers. Uh, from the time children go into high school, there is no support there for those children. So I'd like to see those areas improved and I will be working, I will work with my local member to see if we can improve on those issues. Thank you, those are fantastic ideas. You know, I said before I'm an economist at heart, you know, what I studied at UWA. Um, and so I believe that we should be trying to let the market be as free as we possibly can, which is why I'm very supportive of changing the tax regime to allow tax deductibility for childcare, because I think tax deductibility allows then everyone to make the choice about the sort of childcare they'd have. And if we freed up some more money, there'd be more demand at the cost that people are prepared to supply childcare, and I think we would see more childcare centres. I was told there's only two childcare centres in the entire Perth CBD. Now, I'm not sure that's true, but I'm gonna find out over the next little while, because anyone that has to go into the CBD will know the time of commute, and if a childcare centre is only available to you in the suburbs, and it's operating from seven o'clock until 5.30, and you add your Perth commute on it, there's absolutely no way. So the you know, CBD should be peppered with childcare centres. I mean, it's peppered with bike, you know, end of ride stations. If we can get that right, surely we can get a childcare centre right. I know that um, this is a conversation that could continue for some time, but we, we are um, out of time. Um, can I leave you with, um, I guess, a couple of questions to ponder? Are each of us doing all that we can? And collectively, are we doing the best that we can? It will be lovely at one of these events to be able to come back and not do the, what's the fuss, but where what is now exceptional is no longer exceptional because it is the norm. Diane, thank you so much for reminding us and bringing into focus that we all can do more and do better. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I think we're having to um, vacate just in terms of uh, making the room available for the work that, uh, that the university does. Thanks again.